Well, greetings everyone and welcome back. I'm sorry it's taken so long to get another video out, especially since the last episode I did. I said these videos were going to be coming a little bit faster, but some things changed and I needed to change around my priorities a little bit. I probably have a couple more videos left in this season, and then I'm going to begin next season covering the things I never really got to in the spring, as well as a few things I did that didn't quite work out and I need to go back and re-engineer and rethink a little bit. But before we get into that, I wanted to let you know why it was I had to take a little bit of a hiatus from the videos. These take a lot of time to do, and between work and other family things, sometimes I just didn't have the time. The primary reason is that my oldest daughter was graduating from high school. She and I both loved to sail, and I wanted as much time with my family on the water before things were going to change and she moved off to her next adventure. With my daughter's love of sailing in the ocean, and her enjoyment of being involved in her Junior Air Force ROTC program in high school, we took our family vacation in New England and took her through the United States Coast Guard Academy. The moment she walked onto the campus, she fell in love with it and knew this is exactly where she wanted to go. In fact, it was the only place she wanted to go and the only place she applied to. That's what she wants to do with her life, a career in the Coast Guard, contributing to saving other people's lives, and serving her country. Getting into the Coast Guard Academy is pretty tough. Over 2,000 people apply every year, and they end up selecting around 250 to 275 students. So the Coast Guard Academy, like every other branch of the military, has their basic training. Eight weeks of hell. And that all started in early July. So I only had a few precious weeks in June to enjoy my family of four together one last time. It became more important to get her seaworthy and get her out there and enjoy that time with my family than it was to edit the videos and complete every little detail on the boat. Just before we left for Connecticut, we had one last sail as a family of four. That was a wonderful trip that I'll never forget. My daughter is now a fourth class cadet at the United States Coast Guard Academy and loving every minute of it. At the end of Swab's summer, the cadet's basic training of eight weeks. She spent one week on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Eagle, America's tall ship, used for training officers in the Coast Guard. What my daughter didn't know is that I drove all night so that I could be there when the ship came in to New London to surprise her. I was hoping she'd be glad to see me. I think she was. And I have to say, it's one of the highlights of my life to get a tour of the Coast Guard Cutter Eagle by your own daughter. Coming back to Ohio, I enjoyed a beautiful sailing season, sometimes with my youngest daughter and wife, most of the time by myself, times which I appreciated. But I have to say, I love this boat and the time I spend on it. It's the best boat I've ever had, the best boat I've ever sailed. I cherish and am happy with every moment I'm on it. So now let's get into a little bit more of the work that I did on it this last spring to show you how it got that way. Last fall I took everything off the deck, fittings, handrails. Now it was time to put all that back. In a previous episode I showed you about how I manage rebedding all of the hardware. Starting off first by drilling the holes out that the bolts went in a little bigger than they need to be and refilling the holes with thickened epoxy. This allows for the new bolts to go in and help water from getting in to cause any rot. Putting hardware on in the past has always been kind of a pain. I can't tell you the number of times that I've marked out where a hole should be only to put the drill bit on it and watch it dance across the area where I put the mark and drill everywhere but where I wanted it to go, making the holes off center and nothing lining up perfectly. But now I use a very simple, very inexpensive tool that drills perfect holes exactly where they need to be every single time. These self-centering bits, which come in various sizes and can be purchased on places like Amazon.com for cheap, are used to drill pilot holes in things like door hinges. There's a tubular sleeve on the outside of a drill bit in the center, and the sleeve is spring-loaded. So as you begin to drill down, the sleeve retracts. 
That outer sleeve fits perfectly inside of the hole for the deck fitting and keeps the drill bit perfectly centered in the hole, preventing it from hopping around. Just push down on the fitting enough so that it won't move and drill each hole accordingly. Perfect. By the way, the little marks you see on the deck outside of the fitting are just pencil marks that I used for reference. They're not actually cracks in the deck. I highly recommend getting these tools. They have saved me a lot of grief and a lot of effort. I'll leave a link in the show notes on where you can get these on Amazon. But before they actually get bedded, it's time to start painting. Finally. I'm starting off by using Total Boat's Top Side Primer. It's very well rated. And even though they say only a single coat will do, I decided to put two on to really give the deck some protection. And just a quick tip, this is something I came up with. Rather than stirring the paint from scratch, I came up with the idea to get the solids off the bottom of just turning the can upside down for a few minutes. Let everything that was on the bottom start to move towards the top, and I think it makes stirring the paint a lot easier. Next, I just rolled it on with a simple medium nap roller. It went on smooth, simple, no problems at all, didn't need to be thin. I could see right off the bat it was going to create a great surface for bonding for the next coat of paint, as well as filling in any little hairline cracks that were too small to fill with fairing compound. I know it's only primer, but I really can't tell you how good it started to look with just a nice, clean, uniform color over a deck that's looked pretty rough over the past few months. After that primer dried, it was time to move on to some actual painting. For the sides of the cabin and the cockpit combing, I'm using Total Boat's Wet Edge Paint, which is a one-part polyurethane paint in Oyster White. The first application was done over the primer with a small foam roller. Again, it went on very easily, had a nice look to it right off the bat. It went on very nicely, but I am going to use the roll and tipping method to even the paint out once I get the first coat on. Once I got the coarse work done on that, I went back with a smaller brush to get the areas in the corners. As you can see, it's all masked off with green painter's tape and paper, both on the wood combing cap and the deck. I figure everybody pretty much knows how to put masking tape down, and frankly, it wasn't as much fun as it sounds, so I didn't bother filming any of that. These corner areas are really important. It tends to be where you have two different materials coming in contact with each other, or major areas where water is going to flow down and across. So while the large field areas tend to be a little bit thinner, I tend to put a little bit more down on the corners like this to make sure the water is going to run off properly and not getting any cracks or seams. Once the first coat is down, I came back with a broader, wider brush to do a very light tipping of the paint to take off any bubbles or cross patching, just to even it out a little. And it really started to look great. Now throughout this process, whenever I needed time to let paint dry or whatever, I went in to start to work on the engine. I'm only going to take a minute or two to cover this, but it did take quite a few weeks to get this done. And although I've tinkered around a little bit on cars, the intricacies of marine engines weren't something I had a lot of experience with. So a couple things about that. The first thing I decided to do was put a video camera on the engines while I was working on it to record absolutely everything that I did. Everything I took apart, how everything went together, that way I could go back and refer to it if something went wrong. My plan on this was to rebuild the entire engine insofar as I could. It hadn't been started for at least three or four years. Frankly, I got most of the information for redoing these on YouTube. That's one reason I won't spend a lot of time on this is that your specific engine will have a few eccentricities that you'll need to address directly. But there are hundreds of videos on YouTube about just about every engine you can possibly think of on how to rebuild the carburetor, the fuel pump, the water pump, just about anything you're going to want to redo. And there were times when I used the camera to take some detailed notes of things I wanted to make sure I had for later when I needed to reassemble things. You can buy the kits to rebuild all of these parts off of various places online. I'll include some of the places I used in the show notes below. Most were very helpful and able to give me kits to rebuild entire components, like the fuel pump which I took videos of to watch how I dismantled them so that I could make sure they went back together properly with the new parts.
Well, it was time to give this thing a try. Like I said, it hasn't been even started in several years. I wasn't real confident that this was going to work the first time. But even after just a couple of pulls, it seemed like it was going to want to start. So I pushed in the choke, gave it one more pull, and it started right up. At first, I didn't have any water coming out of the water cooling pipe, which kind of concerned me. But within a second or two, the water started flowing and the engine seemed to be running fine. I ran it through some tests and by all appearances, it was absolutely ready to go. I have to say I felt pretty good about that. Because without an engine, there's no way I can sail this boat in and out of the harbor at my yacht club. And to know that it's actually pretty reliable took a big weight off my shoulders. Now it's time to get back to the painting and finish that off. And this is going to include adding the non-skid, which is going to go on the deck as well as the top of the cabin. As I mentioned in a previous video, I decided to use Kirby Marine Paints for a little extra something special for the deck and the top of the cabin. It was a hard choice, but I decided to go with the salmon color. So between Kirby's great paints and the excellent results I've had with Total Boats paints as well, I guess I'm just going to have to get another boat to try out some new color combinations. Kirby Paints is a family-owned company that's been around for a long time. And when you give them a call, you'll talk to the very person who's going to mix your paint and you can get exactly what you need. As for the non-skid, I came across this product a while ago. I've seen Andy on Boatworks today give this one a try, and I thought I would as well. It's from a company called Soft Sand, based out of Copley, Ohio. They're very, very small rubber pellets, which you can get in different sizes, actually. I decided to go with the medium size. I ordered two bottles of it. They come in these bottles with a shaker on top, so that you can spread the product out evenly. The two ways to do it are to either mix it in with the paint or generously spread it over wet paint that you've just applied to the deck, which is what I decided to do. I put down first one coat of Kirby's and then you just shake out the soft sand over the wet areas like Parmesan cheese over spaghetti. You put it on way thicker than you're gonna need to the point where it almost looks like fine sand over your deck. There are several different ways to take the excess off, but I opted for a small hand vacuum cleaner with a clean brand new bag so that I could recover the material and use it on later projects, or even a second coat. After you're done taking up the excess, it leaves a very nicely textured, but soft and smooth surface, almost like suede. At that point, you're ready for another coat of paint. You can repeat this several times if needed, but the finished product was absolutely perfect. It was exactly what I was hoping for. It's a nice matte finish, which gives just enough texture to keep it safe when it's wet, and it's nice and soft on your bare feet and knees. So I would highly recommend soft sand. Now it's time to start putting some of the deck hardware and fittings back. One of the things that had to go back was the Stern Traveler. It's a bent bronze rod that goes down underneath the deck and was held just by two nuts on the top and bottom. This created a lot of problems because it was sending an awful lot of force through a very small point and that created a lot of cracks in the deck. So I decided to place a metal plate underneath the deck to distribute the force a little more, and above deck I added these wooden discs. The only problem that I hadn't considered is that the thread length of that rod no longer goes down far enough below the deck to put the nut onto it. I didn't need much, and I didn't want to do anything destructive to it, so I picked up a threading die set, and it fit perfectly. All I had to do was add another 3 quarters of an inch of thread on either side, and I was able to attach it and secure it fine. After an entire season of sailing with it, in some cases under some pretty rough conditions with some heavy loads on it, it's worked perfectly with no sign of distress to the deck. Next I moved on to a couple of winches. After taking them off in the fall, I completely rebuilt them. Took them completely apart, cleaned every part, lubed every part, and put it back together. I added a new Teflon sleeve on the inside and out to make it work a little bit better. And secured the base of it to the deck using butyl tape underneath, which I'll get into a little bit more here in a minute. Putting some of the bronze cleats back on top of the cabin that would secure the halyards, I now had the new holes drilled through the epoxy, which was again an insulator to keep moisture from getting into the core. So I just pushed a little bit of it down into the hole, spread out the rest through over where the fitting was going to sit, 
put a little extra on the fitting itself and started winding down. Placing a washer and nut underneath, I would get each screw a little bit taut and then move on to the next one. This allowed for a much more even application. It's not a good idea to crank one down as tight as you can then move on to the next one. Trying to keep them all as evenly tight while it's going down ensures a good proper fit. Once each one was down, I just used a knife to cut off the excess butyl tape. This is going to help keep water from getting into those holes in the first place. One of the nice things about butyl tape is it never really hardens. And as the season goes on, between movement, stresses, and heat, more butyl tape can squeeze out of the bottom. In that case, you just take a knife and trim off the excess, which could continue to happen for a couple of months, at least. I've got a lot more deck fittings to show you being put on, including some specialty things I made specifically for this project, as well as a few treasures that I found to restore this boat back to its glory. I'll cover that in the next episode, along with making from scratch a new spindle for the top of the mast, the new woodwork on the hatch, putting the companionway doors back, refinishing the seats, and a whole lot more. But I mentioned at the beginning of the video some new projects that I'm going to be starting that I thought you'd be interested in. One of the projects I'm going to start this winter is a do-it-yourself chart plotter. I've been looking into these for a while and the commercial ones are so expensive it's really way out of my price range. Having come from a computer background, I knew it really couldn't be that tough to make one. So I'm going to show you step by step and part by part how you can make a very high grade, high quality, very accurate chart plotter built on a $40 single card computer, an inexpensive touch screen, GPS receiver, and free open source software to make it all work. And it should come out to be less than $200. So keep an eye out for some episodes of that project coming soon. And there's one more thing. I've got more work to do on the Harishoff America, including the interior of the cabin, as well as fixing a few things just from this last season. But something came my way I just couldn't pass up. Sitting out somewhere in Maryland was this little beauty, a Harishoff Eagle. Another wonderful boat designed by Halsey Harishoff, very similar to the Harishoff America, but with a different rig and a slightly different hull configuration. It had a date with a chainsaw in a couple of weeks, with the remnants headed for the landfill. But I managed to get it out just in time. So if all goes well, this little jewel should be back in my makeshift shipyard sometime this spring. Although she needs a lot of work, far more than my Harishoff America. So this one's going to take a while to get back together. But I'm committed to seeing her back in the water again. I may name this boat Casa del Fido. Because when my wife finds out, this may be where I'm living for the next couple years. Anyway, thanks for joining me, and I will get another video out just as soon as I can. Thank you.